Howdy Moz fans and welcome to another edition of Whiteboard Friday. Today I'm going to tackle a subject around some of these changes that a lot of us in the marketing and SEO fields thought Google would be making, but weirdly they haven't. And this comes up because I talk to a lot of people in the industry. You know, I've been on the road the last few weeks at a, a number of conferences, uh, Boston for Search Love and SMX Munich, both of which are great events and going to be heading to a bunch more soon. And you know, people have this, this idea that Google must be doing these things, right? Must have made these advancements over the years that it turns out in actuality they, they haven't made them. Some of them there's probably really good reasons behind it, and some of them it might just be because they're really hard, really hard to do. But let's, let's talk through a few of these, and, uh, and in the comments we can get into some discussion about uh, whether, when, or if they might be doing some of these. So number one, a lot of people in the SEO field, and even outside the field, think that it must be the case that if links really matter for SEO, that on-topic links matter more than off-topic links. So for example, if I'm linking to two uh, websites here about gardening resources, right, A and B, both about gardening resources, and one of those comes from a botany site, and the other one comes from a site about mobile gaming, well, all other things being true, it must be that the one about botany is gonna provide a stronger link, right? That's just gotta be the case, and yet, we, we cannot seem to prove this. There doesn't seem to be data behind it to, or, or to support it. And anyone who's analyzed this problem in depth, which a number of SEOs have over the years, so a, a lot of people who are very advanced, right, have gone through the process of classifying links and all this kind of stuff, seem to come to the same conclusion, which is, you know, Google seems to really think about links in a more subject, context, agnostic uh, perspective. And I, I think this might be one of those times where they have the technology to do it, they just don't want to. My guess is what they found is if they bias to these sorts of things, they get a very insular view on what's kind of popular and important on the web. And if they have this more broad view, they, they can actually get better results, right? It turns out that maybe it is the case that the one, that, the gardening resources site that botanists love is not the one with mass appeal, is not the one that everyone's going to find useful and valuable, and isn't representing the entirety of what the web thinks about who should be ranking for gardening resources, and so they've kind of biased against this. That, that is my guess, but from every observable input we've ever been able to run, every test I've ever seen from anybody else, it seems to be the case that if there's any bias, it's extremely slight, almost unnoticeable. Fascinating. Number two, I, I'm actually in this camp. I still think that someday it's coming, that, that anchor text influence will eventually decline, and yet it, it seems to be that, yes, while you know, other signals have certainly risen in importance, right, and there have been lots of other things, it seems that anchor text inside a link is still far more important and, and better than uh, generic anchor text. That getting specific, you know, targeting something like uh, gardening supplies when I link to A, as opposed to on the same page saying something like, oh, and this is also a good resource for gardening supplies, but all I linked with was the text a good resource over to B, that, that A, is going to get a lot more ranking power, and you know, again, all things, all other things being equal, A will rank much higher than B because this anchor text is still pretty influential. It has a has a fairly substantive effect, and I think this is one of those cases where a lot of SEOs said, "Hey, anchor text is where a lot of manipulation and abuse is happening. It's where a lot of web spam happens. Clearly, Google's going to take some action against this." And my my guess again is that they've seen that the results just aren't as good without it. And this speaks to the power of being able to generate good anchor text. And a lot of that, especially when you're doing content marketing kinds of things for SEO, depends on nomenclature, naming, and branding practices. Right? It's really about what you call things and what you can get the community and your world to call things. Because you know, Hummingbird has made advancements in how Google does a lot of this text recognition, but for these tough phrases, anchor text is still, still a strong input. Number three. 302s. So 302s have been one of these sort of long-standing, you know, kind of messes of the web where a 302 was originally intended as a uh, temporary redirect, but many, many websites and types of servers default to 302s for all kinds of, of pages that are moving, right? So, you know, A, 301 redirects to B versus C, 302 redirecting to D. Is it really the case that the people who run C plan to change where the redirect points in the future? And is it really the case that they, they do so more than A does with B? Well, a lot of the time, probably not. 
but it still is the case, and you can see plenty of examples of this happening out in the, uh, out in the search results and out on the web, that Google interprets this 301 as being a permanent redirect. All the link juice from A is going to pass right over to B. It, with C and D, it appears with big brands, when the redirect's been in place for a long time and they have some trust in it, maybe they see some other signals, right, some other links pointing over here, that yes, some of this does pass over, but it is not nearly what's happening with the 301. This is like a directive, and this is sort of a nudge or a hint. And it just seems to be important to still get those 301s, those, those right kinds of redirects right. By the way, there are also a lot of you know, other kinds of 30x uh, status codes that can be issued on the web and that servers might fire. So be careful. You see a 305, a 307, 309, something weird, you, you probably want a 301 if you're trying to do a permanent redirect. So be, be cautious of that. And speaking of nudges and hints versus uh, directives, RHEL Canonical's been an interesting one. So when RHEL Canonical first launched, what Google said about RHEL Canonical is, RHEL Canonical is a, is a hint to us, but we won't necessarily take it as gospel. And yet, Every test we saw, e even from those early launch days, was, man, they are taking it as gospel. You know, you throw a, a rel canonical on a trusted site accidentally on every page and point it back to the homepage, Google suddenly doesn't index anything to the homepage. It's crazy. And you know what? The tests that we've seen run and the, the mistakes, oftentimes, sadly, it's mistakes that are our examples here, that have been made around rel canonical have shown us that Google still has this pretty harsh interpretation that a rel canonical means the page at A is now at B. And they're not looking tremendously at whether the content here is super similar. Sometimes they are, right? Especially for manipulative kinds of things. But you got to be careful when you're implementing rel canonical that you're doing it properly because you can de-index a lot of pages accidentally. So this is, a, this is an area of caution. It seems like Google still has not kind of progressed on this front and, and they're taking that as a pretty basic directive. Number five, I think, you know, for, for a long time, a lot of us have thought, hey, the, the social web is rising. Social is where a lot of uh, the great content is being shared, a lot of where people are pointing to important things, and where endorsements are happening, more so potentially than the link graph, right? It's, it's sort of the, the common man's link graph has become the social web and the social graph. And yet, it, with, with the exception of the two years where Google had a, you know, a very direct partnership with Twitter and, and those, Twitter, uh, those tweets and, and indexation, all that kind of stuff was heavily influential for Google search results. Since that partnership broke up, we haven't seen that again from Google. They've actually sort of backtracked on social and they've, they've kind of said, hey, you know, tweets, Facebook shares, likes, that kind of stuff, it doesn't, doesn't directly uh, impact rankings uh, for everyone. And you know, Google Plus being sort of an exception, especially in the personalized results. And, uh, but even the tests we've done with Google Plus for non-personalized results have appeared to, to do nothing as, as yet. And so you know, these shares that are happening all over social, I think what's really happening here is that Google is taking a look and saying, hey, yes, lots of social sharing is going on. But the good social sharing, the stuff that sticks around, the stuff that people really feel is important, is still later on at some point earning a citation, right? Earning a link, a mention, something that they can, that they can truly interpret and, and use in their ranking algorithm. And so they're relying on the fact that social can be a, a tip off or a tipping point for a piece of content to, or a website or a, a brand, a product, whatever it is, to achieve some popularity, but that will eventually be reflected in the link graph and they can wait until that happens rather than using social signals, which to be fair, there's some you know, manipulation, potential manipulation I think that they're worried about exposing themselves to. And there's also of course the, the case that they don't have um, you know, direct access, well, they don't have API level access and partnerships with Facebook and Twitter anymore. And so that, that could be causing some of that too. Number six, last one. I, I think a lot of us felt like, you know, as Google was cleaning up web spam, right? For a long time, they talked about cleaning up web spam from, you know, but from 06, 07 to about 2011, 2012, it, it was pretty sketchy, right? It was, it was tough. And um, when they did start cleaning up web spam, I think a lot of us thought, well, eventually they're going to get to PPC too. I, I don't mean pay per click. I mean uh, porn, pills, and casino. But it turns out, as uh, uh, Matt Brown from Moz wisely and recently pointed out in his uh, Search Love presentation in Boston, that yes, 
If you look at the uh, search results around these categories, you know, uh, whatever it is, buy Cialis online, uh, Texas Hold'em, no limit poker, um, uh, removed for content, because Whiteboard Friday is family friendly, folks. Uh, you know, whatever the searches that you're performing in these spheres, this is actually kind of the early warning SERPs of the SEO world. And you can see a lot of the, you know, changes that Google's making around spam and uh, authority and signal interpretation. One of the most interesting ones that you probably observed if you study this space is a lot of those like uh, hacked EDU pages or um, barnacle SEO that was happening on, you know, subdomains of more trusted sites that had gotten a bunch of links, that kind of stuff. That is ending a little bit. <clears throat> and we're seeing a little bit more of the rise again of like the exact match domains and the, uh, some of the affiliate sites and getting links from more creative places because uh, it does seem like Google's gotten quite a bit better at which links they consider and in how they judge the authoritiveness of you know, uh, uh, pages that might be hanging on or clinging on to a domain but aren't well linked to internally on some of those more trusted sites. So that said, I'm looking forward to some fascinating Comments, I'm sure we're going to have some great discussions around these, and we will see you again next week for another edition of Whiteboard Friday.